So this lecture will start by looking at what's the behavior of the discontinuity. How would the discontinuity look differently if we evolve it for an epsilon amount of time? All right. Does that make sense why we are doing that? Yeah. yeah, this is because even though in the blue curve, in the blue curve, it's the solution u at t. The red curve is u at t plus epsilon. The difference is that I have allowed the discontinuity to evolve for a little bit in a physical way. And in this particular case, remember, uh, a physical system has a little bit of viscosity. So, so, and we are never allowed to have characteristics bumping into a discontinuity. So in this case, the discontinuity is going to disappear instantaneously and form a fan. And for t plus epsilon, the fan is very, very small, but still it's a fan. So at this, at the original point of this discontinuity, the solution now is well defined. It's no longer a discontinuity. The solution is actually u equal to zero. And the flux, which is defined as u squared over two for Burgess equation, is going to be zero. So, so the flux we should be using in a finite volume scheme is the flux at t plus epsilon. If we are able to analyze the behavior of the discontinuity for an, only for an epsilon amount of time, we would be able to evaluate the flux. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so what's the behavior of the discontinuity in epsilon amount of time? That's that problem is called the Riemann problem. Okay. The Riemann problem is how a discontinuity would evolve for a tiny bit of time. Equivalently, for asking how a discontinuity would evolve for epsilon amount of time, it's like if you have a discontinuity and if you zoom in, because we expect the discontinuity to be moving only a tiny bit in a tiny bit of time. So we can't afford to zoom in if we're only considering very small amount of time. And just like last time, when we zoom in into enough, the discontinuity is like a discontinuity between two constant functions. So another way to state what is a Riemann problem, one way to state is how a discontinuity would evolve for absolute amount of time. Another way to state it is that how a discontinuity between two constant functions would evolve right, for a finite amount of time. So let's look at how to solve that problem. So let's say this is x, this is u. For Burgess equation, it's very clear, right? For Burgess equation, because I know if I know I have two cases for Burgess equation. One case is when the left constant is greater than the right constant. Another case is the opposite. The left is lower than the right. So for the first case, we know what is the discontinuity going to, be, going to be doing? Right, for Burgess equation, uh, du, sorry, df du is a increasing function as u increases. So which side has a faster characteristic, left or right, in, in the upper case? The left is going to have a faster characteristics, and the right is going to have a slower. That means, is the shock wave going to dissipate or is it going to be maintained? It's going to be maintained because the characteristic will bump into the shock wave. Okay, and so we know the, sh the discontinuity is going to stay. The only thing we don't know is if it is going to move towards the left or move towards the right. All right. So, this case actually also splits into two cases. The first case is delta f over delta u is greater than zero. That means the characteristics move towards the right. And in this case, let me draw, uh, let me draw the discontinuity after a little bit. So the discontinuity after a little bit, let me, uh, the red is uh, a u at t. And let me draw u at 
t plus epsilon is going to be moving towards the right, right? So this is the green case. So what's my flux at the discontinuity going to be like after epsilon amount of time? What is the flux at the original discontinuity at x0 after epsilon amount of time has passed? Equal to the flux evaluated at ul, right? Because after the shock has moved for a little bit, the solution here is ul, all right? So my flux in this case should be f of ul, while in the other case, if I have the opposite case, delta F over delta U is less than zero, the shock would have moved towards the left a little bit. And in this case, my F at x zero would be what? F at UR, right? So this is UL, this is UR. Now this behavior is what we captured in the upwinding scheme, right? We bias the F towards either U of F of UL or F of UR, depending on which side the shock wave is moving.